To which now we come to chapter 9. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? Notice this. He says, am I not a, an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus? This is one of the prerequisites to being an apostle. You've actually seen the Lord. That's just one of them now. From whom in Christ's personal appearance to me, I have received my apostolic commission. This was judged essentially necessary to constitute an apostle to see Christ yourself. Well, we know that today many are calling themselves apostles. And one of the more troublesome is this of Geno Jennings. My divine skill was godly given. I didn't go to no seminary school, right. never took no Bible course. I never studied theology. Right. Right. I didn't get this from my mother. No, no. No, I didn't get this from my blood father. Amen. I got it. I got it from God. That's right. That's right. Sir. Only God himself can instill such boldness within a person. Paul is a different kind of apostle. Paul was taught by the Lord himself for three years apart from the other apostles. And it's interesting. Um, a lot of people today will call themselves apostles. And let me say unequivocally, we have no apostles today. Amen. They're, they're gone. The age of the apostles is over. There are no apostles today. According to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, the apostles, right, and the prophets were the foundation upon which the church is built. I don't know how many foundations your house has. Mine only has one. Huh? The foundation is done. We do not have apostles today. The apostles have the authority to give us the scriptures. We do not have people today who have the authority to give us the scriptures. We do not have apostles today. Because if you are really sent by God, your doctrine is going to line up clearly and perfectly with the languages that God himself ordained. He's the one that ordained that this Bible, the Old Testament, be written primarily in Hebrew and the New Testament primarily in Greek. That was God's doing. And so if rules of Greek grammar and Hebrew grammar don't line up with this apostle's doctrine, surefire way to see that this person is off. So with a person like Geno Jennings, who believes that there is no such thing as a trinity, a person like Geno Jennings, who believes that um, you can lose your salvation. A person like Geno Jennings who believes that we are supposed to speak in these ecstatic languages, these, these, this babbling, these tongues that he calls them. You can see where his doctrine is off. Whenever they begin to apply these titles to them, prophet and apostle and all of this, then obviously they're wanting to set something in your mind that places them apart from all others. They want to be special. They don't want to just be a teacher or a preacher as if that's not the highest honor in the land to preach God's word. But no, they, they want to be greater than everyone else. It's a very selfish stance to take. Verse 2, If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye and the Lord. And the only thing that Paul is meaning right here is that to the new converts in whom didn't see Paul as an apostle, and this was one of the contentions within Corinth, they were saying how Paul wasn't one of the original 12. He came along the Damascus road. This was years after Christ and uh, all of this. But anyway, he's saying unto you all that have seen me and heard me preach unto you, you know, I am most certainly an apostle. My answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? And this power is just referring to his right as an apostle. Do we as apostles not have the right to eat and drink, to have you all pay for our stuff? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, Simon Peter, or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? And though verse 5 can be a bit confusing because there's quite a bit being thrown in there, what he's meaning there is, while we go about on these mission trips, do we not have the right to take a Christian woman for a wife? But what does he mean in verse 6? Or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working? 
And just for clarification, I'll quote Ellicott on this. They, as well as the others, had the right to abstain from working for their living. Barnabas' early association with Paul in Acts 11, 12, 15 probably led him to adopt the apostles' practice of supporting himself and not being dependent on his fellow Christians. Verse 7, who goes to war at any time with his own charges? Speaking of a soldier, who plants a vineyard and eateth not the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Meaning, is this only referring to oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, That he that ploweth should plow in hope, And that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? We're giving you eternal things, so for you to pay us money is nothing. But Paul goes on with this. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather, or the more so? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. You see, this is one of the reasons why a very wealthy preacher, he loses so much credibility with the people. It's not that a preacher shouldn't be paid, but whenever he begins to accumulate so much wealth, then people from the outside and even many within his own congregation will view him as only doing it for the money and thereby it hinders the gospel. It shows Paul and the apostles genuine attitude towards these people and that they took nothing from them. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Speaking of the priest of old, or the priest at that time, the temple wasn't destroyed yet. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it's better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. And in essence, what Paul is saying is that if I do this willingly, meaning without taking any money from anyone at any time, working with my own hands, if I actually want to do this, I have a reward laid up in heaven. But if he does it against his will, then it's still a job that needs to be done. To which he carries on in verse 18, What is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And I really like Benson's comment about Paul on this. In other words, he acted with a self-denying a regard to their interest and as much caution not to offend them as if he had been absolutely in their power, as a slave is in that of his master. Where is the preacher of the gospel who treads in the same steps today? Verse 20, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are without the law, the Gentiles, as without the law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ with this Christian freedom, which is universal, it's not confined as the law of Moses to the Jews and Israel, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now these verses have led to many distortions in people's minds. They say, well, look, Paul, he became all things to all men. So I can become a drunk in order to reach my drunk buddies. I can go to parties and I can go to clubs and bars. No, there were always boundaries with Paul that he would not cross. He went to the extent that Christian liberty would allow, but he never stepped over into evil sins. It was not to get money, influence, or honor, but to save souls. It was not to get ease, but to increase his labors. It was not to save his life, but rather that it should be a sacrifice for the good, a 
of immortal souls. This accommodation was one of a servitude. It wasn't one in which, hey, I'm just going to become buddies to these people and then they're going to look at me as oh so great or any of that. No, he says, as long as they learn the gospel, I don't care how they really view me. Just as we read in verse 23, and this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. He's speaking of the athletes that actually run in races. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And, I re and he's saying, follow after their example in their self-discipline. They abstain from all things, wine, sex, sleep. They're moderate in everything that they eat. He says, be as disciplined as they are. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Now he's going from the image of a racer to that of a boxer, someone in whom's just punching at air. He's actually trying to land, you know, the punches, implying to make every move that we make for the gospel's sake impactful, something in which will further the gospel. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. To which Paul is implying that if such earnest, self-denying watchfulness over himself be needed still, with all his labors for others, to make his own calling sure, much more is the same needed by the Corinthians, instead of their going, as they do, to the extreme limit of Christian liberty. He says, I put my body under meaning I stay disciplined in order to make sure that I am within the body of Christ in order so that at the very end of this life's race, I am not found a castaway. And so work out once again, outwardly your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's not talking about work salvation. That's saying, if you have the true faith, then you'll have these works, which even pertain to self-discipline. 